My name is Francesco Spagnolo, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second of two Meet the Composer live streams for the Israeli Music Prizes. This live stream is brought to you in partnership with Kles Canada, a world leader in fostering Jewish culture and artistic creativity, and Montreal Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. Today, it is my pleasure to speak with two of the three 2020 laureates, composer Itzhak Yedid, winner of the Israeli Prize for Jewish Music, and Yotam Heber, winner of the Israeli Commission for Jewish Music. Established in 2014 by the Israeli Foundation, the Biennial Israeli Music Prizes offer opportunities for the discovery, creation, performance, and celebration of excellence in music composition. The prize package awarded to each AMP laureate, valued at 200 thousand Canadian dollars is comprised of a $50,000 cash prize, three international performances, including a gala concert on October 22nd, 2020, and a recording of their prize-winning work on the Analectic label. Altogether, this makes AMP the largest competition for music composition of Canada and one of the most significant in the world. You can learn more about the Israeli Foundation and the Israeli Music Prizes online at israelifoundation.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce Itzhak and Yotam. Welcome both. Thank you, Francesco. It's so great to be here. It's wonderful to be together uh, between California, New Hampshire, and Australia. Uh, it's, uh, we're sort of satellite brothers, if you, if you know the reference to uh, American public radio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and in a way, I feel like there is a kinship in our, in our trajectories. We all cross many musical worlds and Israel and Israel and the, the, the meetings of, of, of musical cultures in Israel is really one of our uh, strong connecting points. And uh, I, on, a, on a personal note, I've been sort of thinking together with Yotam for I think a little over a decade when he discovered Italian Jewish music and he continues to come back to the scene of the crime. And I am totally fascinated to meet in person Itzhak. Uh, I've heard so much about you and uh, I know that you are in constant conflict in the meeting of East and West musical traditions, uh, all on your piano and your compositional uh, head. It's, it's not an easy task. Maybe we can start from you. You're, you're dedicating uh, your, your prize winning work to the city of Jerusalem and its soundscape. Um, when did you start tuning into the sounds of Jerusalem? And can you point our audience towards uh, what are the most relevant sounds for you? Then we'll get into your composition. Okay, so um, first I, I, I want to say that uh, the piece is dedicated to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So it's it's Harbait. It's uh, it's one of the holiest place for for the Muslims and the holiest place for the, for the Jews. And this is a place that uh, one of my first memories as a child because I was born in Center Jerusalem, and um, we were walking. To, to the Kotel to, to do Tfilot. So, so that's, 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 that's the first thing. And it's, it's the sounds that I hear. This is something that I've later on in my life discovered. It's the sound of um, uh, cantorial music. It's the sound of um, Arabic influenced Jewish music. It's the conflicts between people, between um, um, uh, cultures and traditions. So it, it's all together that's, that's influenced me. In a way, what I do is, um, one hand, I, I document what, what I see, but this is my, my way of um, explaining a situation. So yeah, so this piece is dedicated to, um, to these images that I've, uh, I saw as a child in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Can we go a little bit hyper-local with you? Which neighborhood in Jerusalem uh, you were going? And you're telling us about uh, uh, walking with your family to synagogue and to the, to the Western Wall and the Esplanade, which is, by the way, an open-air synagogue. So that's a synagogue, too. Uh, one goes to at least on that side, on the on the Jewish side of the of the wall, and then it opens up to mosques right above. Uh, so, from where would would you walk? Which neighborhood? And how long of a walk born that was? In, it's called the Migrash Rusim. So many people know uh, Zion Square in very center of Jerusalem. It's very close mm -hmm. to East Jerusalem. Uh, it's about. Um, 
maybe 15 or 20 minutes walk from where I uh, was born and lived at my youth to, to the Kotel. So very close. You know, my, my neighborhood uh, at different times, so we, were, we were probably neighbors in Jerusalem. My neighborhood was Musrara, uh, which is one of the neighborhoods of Jerusalem with an Arabic name, even though it's inhabited at this point mostly by Jews and traditionally by North African, especially Moroccan Jews. So my soundscape was starting in the morning on Shabbat with melodies from the local Moroccan synagogue and then walking through the old city and getting to the Kotel and this really cacophony, this clash of sounds and voices and people rushing and, and so on. So I, I can only imagine what, what, it was, uh, what it was for you, but uh, it, a curiosity I have, and we'll, we'll talk about it, I'm just giving you the question and we'll get back to it, is how do these sounds that you've incorporated, internalized since youth, translate into musical instruments? You wrote a piece for 14 players. Uh, so these are voices, these are sounds of the street, these are uh, various forms of singing, communal, and so on, but how do you translate them into instruments? Hold on to that, because I would actually like to bring Yotam into this conversation as well. Yotam, in your case, in your composition, you're kind of like a, a, a musical tourist in my, in my homeland, Italy, and we met around that. I remember you discovered an archive of Jewish music that I had been cataloging years before you you found it in Rome, and these were field recordings made across Italy in the 1950s by the visionary man by the name of Leo Levi, uh, who was an Italian Israeli musicologist, educator, and who realized that there was a host of musical memory that was going to be lost forever. The microcultures of the synagogues of Italy. You fell in love with Rome, but now you've expanded your range uh, across Italy. How did it come about? I am not exactly sure how I how I came across Leo Levy's recordings. Uh, I think it's thanks to some people like you, like Don Haran and other researchers of Jewish music in Italy. I, I knew coming into the American Academy in Rome, where I had a fellowship for a year, that I wanted to do something with Jewish liturgical music uh, traditions. And I had I simply had no idea the, what a, a rich and and fascinating history the music of the Roman Jews have and and in turn the the music of Italian Jewry has it's it's a, especially the Roman musical tradition as you know is so different from the music that I grew up associating with with quote unquote Jewish music it does it doesn't really have that sound of say Sephardic music it doesn't quite sound ashkenazi it doesn't sound north african it's its own thing and uh it's uh as you know the, the roman jews are very very proud of their traditions so as i started to investigate and listen and and speak i discovered a community that is very much very unlike the community that that i grew up in and um you know at on one hand, they are my people, and on the other hand, it is um, a very different tribe. And um, that paradox has been fueling my music now, um, piece after piece after piece that is delving into that tradition. And, and through that lens, I'm investigating my, my own being, my own musical voice, um, it's it seems to be something that i keep turning again and again to and i'm not even quite sure why i'm so fascinated by it but i keep finding new new things and new angles new ways of discovering and 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 hearing these traditions well thank you uh, in in some ways uh, you you have incredible commonalities one is kind of the documentarian vocation that you both had, translating what you hear, whether it's present or past, into, onto the, the compositional page, onto, onto a score. Uh, but you also have another commonality that may be uh, best to clarify for our audience, which is that both Italian Jewish musical history and Israeli Jewish musical history, in fact, are very close to one another, not chronologically, but in the fact that they bring together different traditions different worlds. In the case of Italy, it's, it, Italy was a 
a kind of a landing pad of, of Jewish migration since the 1500s. So uh, Italian Jews, Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, Turkish Jews, North African Jews, uh, strange Ashkenazi Jews, Western Ashkenazi Jews, French Jews, Provence, all of those people were together and kind of lived in the ghettos, which were sort of like the apartment buildings of certain neighborhoods of, of, of Jerusalem, where you, you can be on the first floor in Syria, the second floor in Morocco, then you can have an Ashkenazi family, and you have all these sounds compressed into, <laughs> into a building. And, uh, and we can only imagine as a child, Yitzhak, what you were hearing uh, walking through the streets of Jerusalem and how many different and conflicting sounds are coming your way. But I want to go back to my original question, not just hearing, not just documenting, but translating this on the page of a written composition. That's that's a whole other story. How do you start, Itzhak? Well, um, I started in performance. Actually, the whole thing, I was, I was not um, a trained as a composer. So I, I, I trained as a, a classical pianist and then started performing the music that, um, that I, I grew up, my, my first musical uh, experience um, on the piano. That's, where the, the, that's, that's how I, I started to, to um, investigate how to bring that sounds um, into Western art practice. So, um, First, maybe I should give you. Um, I should give. I should give the listeners an example. So one thing that interested me is heterophonic textures. Listening to the textures of, say, um, people in synagogue um, uh, singing together, um, it's uh, it's it sounds very monophonic. It's um, but if you look close, it's very detailed. So there are a lot of uh, ornaments. Coming from um, from a music point of view, this textures, just as an example, is something that would be very challenging to write for Western art practice musicians. Who what what you're going to tell them? I want you to go a little bit out of tune here. I want you to go on different keys and so on. So that's the first thing. Just understanding what texture I want to bring. So it's this. This is just one example. The heterophonic texture that I had um, at, at synagogues when, when, when I used to go as a child. And it's something, as I said, I, I was developing through performance. So um, to answer your questions um, more specifically, in some cases, I write in very great details um, what, 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 what the ornaments and what the elements, and it could be just asking some players to play a little bit to bend pitch. So pitch variation and ornamentation in other cases is just um, a title, just to give guidance and go and listen to this recording. I have that, not, not in Kadosh, Kadosh and Kiss, but I have it in some pieces of mine. But being also a performer myself, uh, especially because of most of my writing is, is chamber music, I was able to communicate with the performers of what the sounds that I want to hear. So in your case, it's listening, performing, and composing as a, as a trajectory uh, to, the, to the written page. That's, that's what we're understanding. What, what happens with Yotam's uh, uh, approach? Uh, listening in your case is, first of all, based on, at least from what I understand, starting from uh, archival recordings. So it's a different type of experience, right? It's definitely looking back in time. And, and I just wanted to add it to and, and amplify what Yitzhak said, which is that I too is, am so taken by um, the heterophony of Jewish congregational singing, where there is that kind of um, paradox of um, singing together and being alone, um, some, you know, your own relationship with prayer and your own relationship with God uh, means that there is this paradox of Jewish congregational singing that that I hear a lot in the Leo Levy recordings at the Tempio Maggiore in Rome, where you hear everyone, I, I, they, they understand that the idea is that you all start together and you all end together and everybody's singing the same tune. 
but everybody is in their own world. It is so amazing. You know, you know, when we, when you work with really amazing choruses and you ask each person to sing in their own key, in their own tempo, it's a very hard feat to do, but to hear this congregation where everybody is just doing their own thing. And it is, I find it so beautiful. Everybody's doing the same tune, but they, everyone has their own take on it. And it is this, balancing act of being together and being on your own i i just i i'm i'm very very touched by that you know you, you make me smile not only because you're describing a world that i've been studying and uh, i guess uh you know struggling with to describe with uh, for for many many years and it's both the, the the soundscape and the the sound of the synagogue but specifically of the italian synagogue and when you think about rome of course Somebody from Milan like me should not be allowed to actually talk about the venerable tradition of Rome, but I'll just give it a stab. It's actually itself the result of the merging of five different synagogues. There were five synagogues in the, in the, in the Roman ghetto. And then 1904, I think, is when they, they raised down the whole ghetto to build a new, a new neighborhood and the big synagogue that people can visit yeah. today. And they merged five between Italian and, and Spanish synagogues. And there was even a Sicilian synagogue at the time. So what you hear there is the same kind of cacophony, or as, as it's more probably appropriately says, heterophony of, of the synagogue amplified through time, through layers of history, and in a way of cultural clashes. The fact that people come together in the synagogue doesn't, doesn't mean they have to agree with one another, even if they agree to go into the same synagogue. And, well, uh, and, and in, in the case of Itzhak, uh, you know, you're even amplifying this to the sound of a city, one of the most contested city in, cities in the world. So it's, uh, you know, there, it's, it's a brave, um, a brave <laughs> kind of uh, 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 task that you assigned for, for yourself. Um, I would like to focus with you, with both of you, on uh, what you see your pieces moving forward into. Uh, the, the Israeli prize is a phenomenal prize, as we described at the beginning. It gives you funding to create it and also the possibility to have it performed and recorded. Um, it's a, uh, I, I read in your biographical details that uh, uh, a, a music critic said that your music is not for the faint of hearted. Who, how, do you, how do you see your audience? How do you hear your audience responding to this work in particular, Kadosh Kadosh? For me, this is this Kadosh Kadosh and Kirst is is an, as an, an important piece in my portfolio, but it's one of many. So um, it's it's the way I work is is it's all it's a, it's it's in a way I research um, the the sound the soundscape. I want it to be accepted as um, as as uh, something in progress. Yes, it's it's a piece that that um, I've put a lot of uh, efforts to put it together, but it's 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 the whole thing that I want the audience to um, be curious about what came before in my music and in the tradition that I was following and what will come after. I want them to follow me. Your Tom is uh, with us as well, and uh, thinking about audience. Uh, this day and age is 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 really a good uh, problem for composers. There there have been decades of sort of divorce between uh, composers being best friends with their audiences. Uh, <laughs> your 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 work. How how do you see it going towards uh, towards audiences? I will say that that I started and finished this piece during this time of pandemic, and. While the work itself, I, I don't think, has much to do with, in, really, in any specific way with the pandemic, writing it during this period has made me look inwards in a way that I have really not done before. Um, I don't think, in fact, thinking about who I'm writing for, um, the performer, the presenter, the audience, um, those have been very important to me to an extent that I, um, and, and it, to some extent, I think it is important to think, especially about the performer that you're writing for. Um, but the climate at which it will be presented and who will be listening, those things have been um, on my mind 
I think too too much of a degree in the past and and being here um, in rather rural New Hampshire, not seeing really anyone for many, many months now uh, has made me look inward and really write, I think, one of the most, um, I hope, honest pieces. You know, there's a very fine line between simple music and simplistic music. And it's a place that I was trying to, to explore that place. So to answer your question, who is this piece for? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a piece that, that doesn't require um, a degree in music to, to understand. I hope that many people will find something in it. Thank you, Yotam. Thank you, Itzhak. A pleasure talking with you. And uh, carry on, and we're all looking forward to hearing the performance of your work and, uh, and appreciating and learning with you about the many soundscapes of Jewish life together. Thank you, Francesco. To you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing your piece, Yitzhak. And yours as well, and the whole concert. Thank you, Itzhak and Yotam, for sharing your stories, your influences, your inspirations, and your creative process for arriving at these excellent new works. Thank you also to the Livestream partners, Clis Canada and the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, for making this Meet the Composer Livestream possible. And thank you all for joining us for this Meet the Composer Livestream. To hear the world premiere of Yotam and Itzhak's prize-winning pieces, please join us for the 2020 Israeli Music Prices Gala Concert, on Thursday, October 22nd at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Medici TV. That's Medici, M-E-D-I-C-I -I, dot TV or the Israeli Music Prices Facebook page. Thank you again and goodbye. Welcome everyone to the live Q and A, uh, and we we are we're live. And uh, let's start with some of the questions that are coming in. Yotam, the first one is for you. Um, have you started working yet with the ensemble that is preparing your work? And if so, how are rehearsals going? How far in advance do you need to work with an ensemble to prepare new work like this one? You need to unmute yourself. I think. We, they're literally rehearsing as we speak right now in Montreal. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to jump into that rehearsal uh, as soon as we we wrap it up here. Um, but I'm very excited to be here answering questions. So let's take all the time we need. Um, it's been very exciting to work with the ensemble. Um, the challenge, of course, of hearing all sorts of nuances of balance is tricky. Is tricky. Um, but I think that the ensemble um, is spectacular. It's an incredible ensemble. And they are in very, very good hands with Vancouver conducting and Christina Zabo singing. Um, from what I've heard, I feel this is one of those rare instances where I just feel like the piece is in truly, truly safe hands. And the, the artistic decisions that they're making are ones that are really in line with my vision of the piece. That doesn't happen very often. And so I, I'm very excited about what, what I've been hearing so far. Thank you. It's Huck. Um, a question for you. You, you talk about Arab-inspired Jewish music as an influence on your own compositional work. Can you give us an example of what you're talking about? Yes, do, do you first hello everybody. Nice to um, meet you and talk to you from Perth, Western Australia. Um, yes, do you want me to, to play an example or do you want me Go to ahead. talk Go ahead. about it? Go ahead, do that. Uh, to play something? Sure, if you can. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm little, um, Many times, the, the big influence is uh, the Piotim and Bakashot. Can you hear me? Yes. 
So um, major influence on my music is the Piotim and, and Bakasho. This is the music that, that I grew up um, and it's probably the, the, the first music that I've uh, encountered. Yeah, so it's, it's what influence, interests me is the, is the textual of, 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 um, of people or the, the musical texture of, of monophonic melody sang by a number of people. So um, I thought about an example that I can play even on the piano. I'm here near the piano if, if you want me to. Um, I can show here. If I play a melody by one person, it will sound like this. If there are going to be two people singing that, it, it might sound more like this. There will be a number of people that, sound, that sing it the same melody, it sounds like this. And if it will be maybe a choir, it will sound like this. So this is uh, one source of inspiration for me to compose music um, that it's not exactly, um, you know, that, that it sounds very simple in a way, but there are a lot of details in that, in, in the rhythm and in the fluctuation of the tone also in tone quality. And uh, it's like another question for you. Do you use quotations of Jewish music in your, in your work or do you write your own music inspired by the materials that you hear? No, I write my own music. I don't use quotation. I don't think I ever use quotation. And um, there are some instances that it sounds like, but a lot more in many other cases, uh, it, 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 you, you wouldn't hear the, a great uh, direct influence. So it is influence, but you won't hear that it sounds uh, Arabic-like or Arabic-Jewish-like. So if it sounds like Jewish-like, then, then, then you might hear it. But in many cases, it's just, it's just influence. But it's, it's to do with ornaments. It's to do with um, the textural thing. And Yotam, a similar question for you, actually. Uh, in, in your case, you're using uh, recordings from, from the archives, from the Leo Levy collection. Can you talk about the recordings that you included in, in the composition and what you, what you do with them? Well, y y you are the world's foremost expert on these recordings Whoops. because you had a great hand in, in, in curating them and um, editing them. These are these marvelous recordings that this pioneering ethnomusicologist, Leo Levy, Israeli, Italian um, expert on the liturgical music of the Jews. Uh, I came across them thanks to you and, and some other great scholars in this, in this field when I, when I was in Rome. Um, about 12 years ago. And um, I, they, they have become an incredible, incredibly important mu uh, source for me. And so I, in a way, I'm sort of like the opposite of Yitzchak, that m m most of the music that I've written in the last 12 years um, has as its, as its starting point, the liturgical traditions of the Jews of Italy. Um, and uh, and so we're going to hear that in my in my piece on Thursday. Uh, one last question for both of you, I would say, came in for its hack, but it's really it's good for both of you. What will be the future for this new piece? Will it be played again? What will happen to it? Yotam, and then we close with its hack. Well, the, the you know before COVID struck, there were, were great plans to bring this work to New York, to bring it to to um, to Israel, possibly to London. Um, I, I I hope that that this work will have a life. I, I'm I really believe that the Israeli Foundation. One of the great things about the prize um, is that um, they're not content with just presenting this piece once. So I, I really admire that. It's really something so important for composers. The first premiere is always easier than the second performance, and I. Um, I, I, you know, we're going to make a recording, which is wonderful. And I hope that we find more homes for this piece. Thank you. It's Huck. Future of your. Yes, I, I believe the piece will. Uh, yeah, the, the, the future of the composition, I think the piece will be performed again. Um, from what I understand, there are 
a number of ensembles that uh, are interested. But also for me, um, the piece will be uh, performed maybe in different variations as well as the whole piece, Kadosh, Kadosh and Kirst. Sometimes what I do, um, I make, um, um, I take something from that piece to another instrument. So that's, that's another way that uh, the piece will be perhaps presented. So it derived from that piece, it, will, it might be another piece, but it's, it's, you could see the link from that piece. So that's, it's always growing from one piece to another. So that would be another way of presenting it. Thank you, thank you both. And thank you to, the, to those who are watching uh, as from listening to your music from home. Uh, remember to join us again on Thursday for the live stream performances of your uh, compositions. Thanks again, Yotam and Itzhak. And uh, thank you all at home and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>